Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed, part three, Q&A, March, April, May, what day is it? Month? I've forgotten again. <laughs> You're getting the days and months confused now. <laughs> no, apparently we're in April, aren't we? Yeah, apparently. So that, that's what Tim's told me. He could be trolling me. No, we're in April. Um, part three, Q&As. What else? That's that's it. More questions. Yeah, let's go. More yeah. questions. We're going to do some answers. Before I forget where I am, let's get on with this. Next question, a bit of a different one. It's good to have a bit of a variety in here. Uh, around what YouTube slash Patreon subscriber accounts did Hardware Unboxed become financially sustainable as a full-time job? Also, at what subscriber numbers did it become possible for you all to buy any necessary products for review, thereby unshackling you from the influence and control of industry? <laughs> Let us out the main channel. Beat that out. I don't know. We'll censor that. <laughs> I'll do some um, editing work. Look, um, I guess the easiest way to answer... We've, we've sort of, I think, addressed these questions before. The easiest way to answer it is... With both Tim and myself working full time on the channel, and obviously then the channel having to sustain us uh, or support us, would be a not. It's not really a subscriber count or a Patreon thing because we really the Patreon thing we don't use as an income. We really use that for buying monitors and laptops for Tim to drill holes in and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, I would say around uh, when we were sustaining about two million views a month. Yeah. Would you say that? It's views. It's definitely it's views, views instead of subscribers. So. Yeah. Subscribers are, well, I mean, I wouldn't say meaningless. I was about to say meaningless. I mean, because generally if you have a certain amount of subscribers, you generally get a certain amount of views, but then that also depends on how much content you put out, stuff like that. So, yeah, it really falls back to views. So 2 million views per month um, was when we could, you know, both of us could comfortably get by and live off the channel. Mm. Um, and then as, as time progresses you gen tend to make a little bit more per view as your channel gets a bit bigger. So what what happens where you know two million views now would be a bit different to two million views for us, let's say three years ago. As things like your Patreon account grows, your other sources of income might grow as well. And that's going to depend a lot as well. Like if you're doing two million views but you didn't have things like a Patreon, then two million views may not be the level that would sustain your sure. operation. Yeah. So it's going to depend a lot on those sorts of things. Yep. So, yeah, that's kind of the way it is. And then what would you say for being able to buy necessary products as well? Well, it's it like, depends on what products you're buying, how often you want to buy them, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and, and again, that comes back to other stuff. Like the 2 million views thing, I think all other things aside, you, you can live off that. That yeah. can, And then it depends on what else you want to do with the channel as to how much more money you need. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, the Patreon account certainly allows us to buy whatever we want without thinking about it. Like, you know, I had to buy a heap of Z590 and, and B560 motherboards that certain manufacturers wouldn't send, and we just go buy them. Tim needs a monitor. We don't really allocate that budget anymore, whereas we did sort of initially. Now it's just like, you got to buy a monitor, go buy a monitor. you got to buy an A15 laptop to drill some holes in it, go do that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's great, and that's why we really appreciate the community we've got supporting the channel, because it means that... Yeah, we don't have to worry about what the manufacturers will or won't send. If they you know, don't want to play ball, we just go buy it. And then we expose whatever they're trying to hide, <laughs> which yep, has happened nice. many times now. Next question is, with all the talk of 14 nanometer of Intel being done, but still being competitive until the last six months, do you think AMD should be worried what will happen when, not if, uh, Intel gets their 10 nanometer or even 7 nanometer working from a performance perspective? I get where this question is coming from because obviously you would expect a performance improvement moving to a newer node. So if they've been able to do as well as they have been on 14 nanometer, then, you know, potentially as soon as they get that nice little upgrade and boost, then, you know, that could send AMD into a bit of strife. But at the same time, the 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer designs that we had were based on you know the performance upgrade that you get versus 14 nanometer from several iterations before like it's only in the most recent iterations that we've had 14 nanometer cpus do like five gigahertz mm -hmm. like if you, if you look back at kb lake or something like that which was what the second 14 nanometer cpu or even the third generation or something along those lines yeah they weren't hitting that sort of frequency yet so there's always a question when you move from one super super refined node running at super high frequencies to a new node can they get the frequencies that are required so there's going to be 
the upgrade that they're getting from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer has potentially shrunk over time as they've been able to get more and more out of that 14 nanometer node. So yeah, there's still a lot of questions there that I don't think AMD should be super worried. I mean, they've got node advancements coming up as well, being able to move to five nanometer, which shouldn't happen too far after Intel gets on 10 nanometer. So Also, when people make these arguments, which we've been seeing since the dawn of Ryzen, let's say, yeah, I don't take other factors into consideration, which we're starting to see play out now. So with Ryzen, Intel has been dominant with gaming performance. They yeah. haven't been dominant with productivity ever since Ryzen showed up. Even first generation Ryzen for core heavy productivity tasks was very competitive from yeah. the outset, despite the fact that it had you know much weaker DRAM latency, much weaker core to core latency for productivity tasks. It did really well and it's improved since then. Intel is really good in gaming because for the most part, their mainstream processors have had four cores. You know, we sort of, they tacked on to six and then eight, but they had for the most part, four cores in a very small die packed closely together, very low latency because of that design. But when you want to scale that design up and add lots more cores, uh, which we're starting to see now, is that you know you can improve productivity performance? We're seeing like what twenty. That's where the twenty yep. percent IPC claim was, but gaming performance stays about the same at best, or in some instances has gone backwards because you've increased stuff like core to core latency. And as those designs need to scale up, what are we at eight cores? You know, once they need to start doing twelve and sixteen and more than that, then you know that they're the things they have to overcome. So the gains that they've had in games due to having four really fast cores that are very close together in a neat little you know monolithic package that goes out the window so they sort of have to go backwards before they can go forwards yeah that's definitely all part of it which is why i think you know a lot of people are already making claims about older lake for example based on rumors about pick any high ipc gain number that you want to use 20 percent, whatever mm -hmm. whatever the rumor says it's like we've talked about previously, doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting that in games. Could be anything, so, but that's right. And, and that's where Intel, you know, Intel may need 20% of an IPC gain plus more cores to match AMD, who is significantly ahead in productivity because they offer a 16-core processor. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of that stuff's going to be handy. But then what if it's only 0% or 5% for gaming? Or what if performance actually goes backwards because IPC is the same, but they can't clock 10 nanometer at 5 gigahertz anymore and they can only hit 4.5 gigahertz yep. or something. So you start running into these issues where it's not just, it's not as simple anymore as saying, we're bringing a new CPU out on a new node and it's going to be better because it depends on the architecture. It depends on the clock speeds they can hit. Yep. And the fact that 14 nanometer was able to clock so high, I think is going to cause some headaches and already is because if they were able to get 10 nanometer running at 5 gigahertz, in outside of a mobile chip, then they would have not released this current 11th gen series. It would have been a 10 nanometer CPU. Mm -hmm. But the fact that whatever design they had at the time, it probably wasn't sufficient yep. for, for the gaming and tasks that they would have released that product for. Yep. Now, I see where, yeah, again, we see where you're coming from with this question, but it seems uh, not that clear now that if you said to Intel, you can use the TSMC 7 nanometer process, make a 16 core CPU that's as fast or faster than AMD's for productivity and gaming. I think that's a big ask. Like, I don't think that's something they can just do because they're Intel. Yeah. So I think that'd be very, very difficult for them to achieve. But anyway, we'll see how uh, stuff we'll like this plays out moving forward. Obviously, we've got the 5950X benchmark there. That CPU is not going away mm -hmm. now. So we'll see uh, how long it takes before Intel can beat that for, you know, productivity and, and gaming, I suppose, for, with, with a mainstream desktop processor. Okay, next question here. You have said in the Intel screwed up Rocket Lake 11th gen a launch discussion video that Intel could have just not released an i9 at this generation, keeping the 10900K as the i9 option. It's easy to say in hindsight, but how do you think the tech press you included would have reacted to that announcement from Intel? Well, I think there's a bit more that you have to add on to this question for, th for that to be the case, because what Intel would have had to have done, which we were sort of saying they should have done in, instead, is either pick pick an excuse like delayed 11th gen till later in the year or early next year, whenever it may be for when Elder Lake's coming, due to whatever reasons, su supply or the current market conditions or whatever it may be, 
And instead of announcing a new 11th gen series that we think is a flop, uh, make an official announcement of the 10th gen price cuts. Yep. That would have been... Like, I honestly think the way the market is right now, how difficult it is for people to get PC components at a reasonable price, given all of those things, you know, AMD becoming Intel and offering, you know, only their X parts at these premium prices, like a six core part for $300 US. In a time when their competitors doing that, for them to step in and say, these discounted prices are now official and will be in effect till, you know, at least the end of the year or indefinitely. And then, you know, later in the year or early next year, we'll have our next generation part. I reckon that would have gone over super well. People would have re-evaluated and re-reviewed the existing components with those new prices. And yeah, they would have been go-to parts for many reviewers such as ourselves. So I think that would have played off better. Yeah, there would have been some disappointment they're not getting a new, we're not getting new CPUs. But I think getting those CPUs at the, at the current discounted prices. And they did some, I mean, they didn't do exactly this, but I remember back in the Broadwell era with like fifth generation, we didn't get much of that, that launch on desktop. They basically went from fourth to sixth gen stuff. Yeah, that's right. So they could have done something very similar here where you just go from 10 to 12th. The other option would have been like refreshing the 10900K as an 11900K, but make it basically the same instead of going backwards on core count, which I don't know whether that would have worked, but... Yeah, I guess if they had stuck with the 10900K, done exactly what this question says, all the other 11th gen parts as is, except the 10900K was the i9 option instead, would that have been received negatively by the press? And I think it that really comes down to how you how Intel phrases what they were doing and how they describe what they were doing to people. Like if mm. they had said, if they had said, we're releasing the 10900K. Um, and we're not giving you any explanation as to why there's no 11th gen part, then of course that is going to be negatively received. But I think people would have been more reasonable if they said, we have die size limits with 11th gen parts. We're using the same socket, so we can't make the CPU any larger. We're at an, a limit. We could only make up to eight cores with the 11th gen, but we still understand that our 10th gen processor is really strong in the areas that it's strong in, having 10 cores, makes it very strong for productivity. I mean, that might not be true compared to AMD, but they're marketing here, right? So if they had phrased it in that way, I think it would have been received better. It, all it requires is an explanation because there is a legitimate explanation. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it disappointing when companies try and hide that and sort of get around it by saying, oh, no, no, yeah, we, we had to use eight cores because you know, we're more concerned about single thread performance. Like, that's not the reason. Yeah. The reason is because you couldn't put 10 cores in the die. So just say that and let let what happens play out. Yeah, I refuse to believe for a second that Intel officially announcing price cuts for parts, well, across the board, so parts like the 10 900 k would have gone over anywhere near as bad as what the 11900K did. Yeah. Like the 11900K was just like the worst release. Yeah, and I, c I can understand, like I've, uh, one of the videos I watched recently was from Ian over at Anantec where he mm -hmm. described how Intel could have succeeded with the 11th gen launch despite most people criticizing it mm -hmm. based on, you know, they've now learnt what is necessary to backboard an architecture. They've learnt what are the limitations because they've actually taken this product the whole way to market. So they've learned everything they need to learn about backboarding. But I still think that in some ways they could have learned all of those lessons and then just cancel the product yeah, at the I very don't, end. Don't just see why not. You do all the work. you've Because they've already done all the research and development. And they've already was, spent all that money. That's sort of my thought so as well. So at the end, if they just go right at the end, they go, well, we did all that. We've learned our lessons. It's not good enough for the market. So we're not making it. And we'll just discount our 10th gen parts, which again, as we've talked about, are likely to be significant. Not significantly, but cheaper to manufacture. I, I think that'd be the way to go. And especially with the the battle, the bat AMD is not going away. Yeah. Like they're getting stronger mm -hmm. and stronger. And AMD taking, sorry, Intel taking a hit to their reputation, their brand image with what they do with the 11th gen. Again, with what you're saying, I, I feel it was unnecessary. I feel like if yeah. they had have just said, you know, it's still coming, we've got big things in the works, but have our current gen parts at an official price cut. So we're, you know... Mm. They would have come off like the good guys. The, the issue that Intel had was that they didn't have the option to do this, to cancel the 11th gen series, because they teased the 11th gen yeah. series before Ryzen 5000. Like, yeah, way last year. <laughs> so because, by doing that and yeah. trying to get ahead of AMD's announcements, 
they didn't leave them any room to respond to AMD's announcements. Because if they had never teased it, then they could have actually seen Ryzen 5000 performance, yeah, which may have been better than they were expecting, and gone, oh, we're not going to be competitive for this 10th gen refresh is what we need to do, or 10th gen price cuts. So... Yeah, they paint themselves into a corner. Yeah, on by one. teasing it six months ahead, they're, they're kind of like, well, I guess we've got to release it now. We've got to release 11900K because we talked about it like I still way think, too early. I still think even just pretending that never happened and or you know coming up with a legitimate reason as to why it's not going to happen now, I still think that would have been, would have gone over better. But anyway. Yes, possibly. But again, it's kind of... Yeah. They've done what they've done. They've, yeah. got to, they've got to sit in it now and wait for 12th gen. Uh, Steve, with such scathing reviews from you and Gamers Nexus about the 1100K, are you guys officially starting the who gets blacklisted by all the companies first competition? Well, we're definitely not. We'd, we'd rather maintain good working relationships with the companies. Uh, we Actually, we talked about in the live stream, didn't we, how it's better to be in contact with the companies so we can you know work through things and get a better understanding of the product. And a whole heap of other stuff, but no, we're not. We're not deliberately trying to annoy these companies. It's just if a product is garbage, we don't hold back. We we tell you it's garbage. Yeah, we're, we're not making reviews for the companies. We're yeah, making reviews for I mean, you we, guys yeah, viewers. That's right. We've tried to make that point tons of times. Yeah, we don't sugarcoat it, and yeah, we just yeah, we review it for you guys. Um, but I don't think uh, while well, you gave the example of um, myself or Tim and I and Gamers Nexus, I think most reviewers were pretty negative about the eleven hundred K. I saw. Um, while our thumbnails may have been, you know, we said it's it's um, it's not good, <laughs> and Gamers Nexus said it was embarrassing, there were some other thumbnails that were, you know, not what you'd normally expect to be associated with Intel flagship CPU. So there was plenty of negativity around that launch, um, and even from, you know, the established tech sites and things like that. So there wasn't too many that gave the, uh, what would you, how would you phrase it? the reviews that sort of scream, please don't cut off our sample allocation type <laughs> things. There wasn't too many of those, which is really good to see. Um, yeah, I, I think the reviews overall were, were pretty on the on the money. Yeah, and when that sort of situation happens, when the majority of reviews for a product are negative, you're much less likely to get blacklisted because, yeah. you know, are Intel going to go around and start blacklisting hundreds of outlets? Mm -hmm. well, probably not, but if you're the odd one out, like let's say you're testing ASRock motherboards and you're the only one that's found a flaw in an ASRock motherboard, then that that presents a much more likely blacklist opportunity for a, for a company. Yeah. And to be fair, most of the companies don't blacklist you after negative reviews. So you could say the worst possible things about a product that are fair and valid because the product sucks, and most companies don't respond with a blacklist. And it also, like, the problem with the whole, I don't want to get too off off topic you're not this is off topic but i suppose continue the conversation but like companies i think that's yeah. also the problem because there's not it's not this single entity that's that everyone yeah. deals with in the same way companies are made up by the people in different regions and we've even seen it like we've had pick a brand we've had someone there that just doesn't do their job very well not a good representative of that brand not someone you enjoy dealing with and they get replaced by someone who does an excellent job at representing that brand so it's really about the person that you speak yeah and, and that's the same thing with you could ring up for tech support or uh, an rma process warranty type stuff and you can get someone who's not you know, again, you can blame the company because it's down to train the people and make sure, but this person could have gone through all the training and for years they could have done a good job and then they've either got to the point where they just don't care anymore or whatever. I don't really want to just get into human behavior, but you could ring up someone who doesn't do their job well. They give you a bad customer experience and then you could ring up the next day and get someone completely different who goes above and beyond and all they want to do is, you know, satisfy the customer and make sure they have a good experience. So, and that's the same with, how we deal with the companies and you know like msi got a bad rap last year because some people at msi genuinely did a bad job but our local msi team as of the last three or three i think the last three years or so have been amazing like we absolutely destroyed their x570 motherboards and we were the first ones to do it and it had a ripple on effect where you know other people started testing them and finding what we found and we destroyed their boards and they weren't happy initially and then they said, leave it with us. They went and tested the boards. They came back and went, yeah, the boards aren't good enough. You're right. Your testing's valid. Uh, we don't care to challenge that. We're going to do better next time. They sort of hung their heads down and said, we will do better. 
They didn't ask for us to change the thumbnails or anything. But, you know, the, other people in other regions had different dealings with the same company. Mm. Um, so and some, Sometimes companies can get even more mad than, like, for example, with the Asus tough laptop situation where they did not take that criticism particularly well, but they still didn't blacklist us. No, there they, was there some... was never a, a moment where it actually got to putting us on a blacklist. No, I think behind the scenes, but there was perhaps a bit of inappropriate misconduct that was sorted out. Um, yeah, there was some. But, but they, we were never blacklisted. There was there was certainly some vigorous discussions. Yeah, let's there say, some things. Back and forth. There was some things said that shouldn't have been said. But at the end of the day, when you know it, it got escalated, um, the company handled it well. And yeah. it looks and like they've improved still the design. Working with us on they're laptops. still, yeah, yeah, they're still working with us, and yeah, and yeah, above all else, it looks like they've improved the design. Mm. So, the, so, so it takes a lot to get blacklisted. So I think if we are staying a competition, you're going to have to really go above and beyond in terms of what you're doing to get blacklisted. Yeah, well, yeah, again, in our experience, like ASUS has been great to work with, really, um, for the most part. MSI has been fantastic, no complaints with Gigabyte, and then yeah, ASRock. We had a great relationship for multiple decades with them, and then we did one negative piece, and that was it. They stopped answering our emails. They went, yeah. they ghosted us, so, <laughs> and that's how they wanted to play that one. So good luck to them. All right, next question, Steve. Yeah, is the eleven nine hundred K an actual scam? Did you put all these in order or something? Um, well, I, they t I tend to go in chronological order, okay. but so you might um, have had a few 11900K questions around it that released that video. I don't have Google in front of me, but I think by definition, it isn't a scam, though it kind of, well, maybe by definition of scam, it kind of is because it's selling a Core i7 part under the Core i9 branding at a premium. Is that a scam? I don't mm. know. I'd say probably... It's great. It's very borderline scamish. So it's a scam, yep. a dishonest or illegal plan or activity. So it's first of all, that. it's not illegal. It's not, none of that. It's not illegal and it's pro most likely not dishonest because they're not yeah. being dishonest about the product by saying it, it, it you know, does something that it doesn't do. Their performance maybe claims being, are... Maybe they're being dishonest about the Core i7 being better than it should be. Well, the Core... The, the performance data they've presented is cherry-picked, mm -hmm. but it's not inaccurate. I think I'll go with my initial thought that it's not a scam. So I think it's not a scam, but that doesn't mean that it's a good product. <laughs> um, it certainly is up there in terms of trying to do the most you can do to get a sale for a bad product without doing illegal conduct. <laughs> because it's not it's not a good buy. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's very expensive compared to the Cry 7 for a very small performance improvement. Mm -hmm. So that is... Like 3%. It, you know, I was just reviewing recently the like the quad-core Core i7 11370H laptop CPU. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a scam either, mm -hmm. but it's a very... it's You're close to deceiving your customers because that has Core i3 level performance. And the yep. Core i9 part has Core i7 level performance. So, again, it's... It's not a good with, part With that your competitor being so competitive, it's not stuff you want to get known for doing. Like, it really yes, hurts your reputation. It does. This sort of stuff, and it, this is where, you know, again, you brought up Ian's piece, which is fine as a separate thing, but I think as far as their image goes, I disagree. And I disagree with the comments that you can recover all of that in one generation because we've seen you can't. And yet... You probably can if you have the mind share and, and the market share. It's quicker to recover that. But it takes, if you have multiple generations of bad products, it does take quite a while. It takes many generations of good products to get rid of that sort of stigma that was that you uh, gathered with all those bad products, let's say. So yeah, that's right. With them, like they've been struggling in some ways for a few generations now. And it's very clear now to, to everyone who's somewhat of a PC enthusiast that they're struggling. And so they really don't want that to happen. They've 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 made they've uh, made it that the next generation has to really succeed. Whereas yeah, if they had right. have done what we talked about earlier with the price cuts and then I think there'd be less pressure on the next generation to really deliver. Of course that depends on what AMD do with Zen 4 and there's a lot of stuff to yet to happen there as well. Yeah. But anyway, it's so not a scam. Sc yeah, scam scam's very harsh, but I think a lot of the other words you could use to describe the product are all very fair. <laughs> Next question. Would you say a 6700 XT at 850 euro is a good deal? And the reason I put this question in 
is because... What's a euro again? Well, it's a good <laughs> good question. I've offended uh, a good portion of our viewership. I know. Oh, no, all the Europeans, they're switching yeah, off because yeah. we've offended their currency. Um, the reason I bring this up is because in a lot of regions, the 6700 XT... I mean, 850 euros is not a good price because it's supposed to be, what, 500 euros or whatever. But in a lot of regions, the 6700 XT right now is the best value current generation GPU. Like, if you're going out there and you want something from either the... It seems like they're paying about what we pay. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. like in, In a lot of regions, the 6700 XT right now, if you're buying, like I said, if you're buying a current generation GPU... It's probably the best value because it's not great for mining, which is keeping pricing down, which is, yeah, interesting situation. Is it is it a good deal, like the question says? Well, no, because it's not at the, anywhere near the MSRP. But if you're yeah. desperate and you really want a GPU, then it's giving you more performance than a 2080 Ti for less money right it's, now. It's so, I mean, a it's, deal. <laughs> and it's, it's probably... It's, it's the best deal we have. Yeah, it's, it's well, it's a deal and it's... If it's anything like Australia, it's probably in stock, or at least some models are. Yeah. You have more chance of getting one anyway. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I could bring myself to do it. No, not at that price. But again, like if you're desperate, you're better off paying this amount for a 6700 XT versus spending over a thousand euros on a 3070. Yeah, I get. Yeah, depends on what value you put on gaming and stuff like that. So it's yeah. not for me to say whether you should or shouldn't. Really, it's up for you to work out. But I personally, I'd play Fortnite on an APU <laughs> at 720 p <laughs> Okay, Tim. Another question here, unlike any other question. No, these are good questions, though, I suppose, um, and sort of topical. Do you think Intel was expecting good reviews of the 1100K or Rocket Lake in general? So it's not really what we've been talking about. I like that this is sort of a different angle to, yeah. to that those sort of topics. And... You were talking about how you were saying that you think Intel should have learned all the things they learned and right up bef- before just launching it, not launch it. Yes. So you learn all there is to learn and then not make uh, an embarrassing decision by releasing a product that's in many ways worse than your yeah. previous generation product or in some ways. That being the case, did they know that it was going to play yeah. out the way they did? I think there's two groups of people that this question applies to. Yeah. The engineers are smart enough to know, mm-hmm. and I think they would have known. So all the people involved with designing the product would have gone, okay, this isn't great. And you know, all the people involved with internally validating performance, seeing where's our multi-core, where's our single throw performance, what are latencies like, they would have known everything about mm-hmm. how it performs, so mm-hmm. they would have known for sure. Mm-hmm. What's unclear is whether the marketing team would have known because there can be a decent separation between people actually designing a product and the people tasked with selling it. So, for example, if I'm, let's say the engineering manager or the performance specialist person who does benchmarking, it sends a brief of good points about the product to the marketing team. 20% right? faster. Uh, yeah, marketing's so, like, say no more. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you know, the marketing team goes to the benchmarking team, get some good points for me, and they come back with, 20% IPC gains, mm-hmm. um, better single thread performance. We've got the new GPU in there, which is faster. And then the marketing team's like, oh, that sounds pretty good. That's a lot to work with. That yeah, sounds that, good. That, that's some good That's some yeah. good things. We can we can make some slides about that. We can sell this product. And they send it out and they're like, well, you reviewers, you know, this thing, it's got faster single thread performance, it's got a faster GPU, and it's got, you know, all the other performance aspects. I think they could have been surprised, but at the same time, the amount of detail they gave about this 11th gen product was a lot lower than previous launches. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways they probably were hoping for the best, but I think ultimately the reviews wouldn't have surprised them all that much. But again, you never know. It could have been a marketing situation where they were surprised. Like the 20% IPC uplift for productivity tasks is good. There's obviously the power consumption aspect to go along (laughs) with that. that, Yeah. Yeah. But it's just the fact that gaming performance wasn't really improved, and in some instances it was you know, the sort of de- decrease in FPS. So anyway, um, surely Intel knew. But yeah, some, as, as you said, it's different, different departments. Yeah. Next question. Steve always emphasizes in his RDNA 2 reviews that the frequency upper limit for the memory and GPU are enforced by AMD and can't be set higher. 
Meanwhile, the temperatures and fan speeds are quite low compared to an Ampere card. Any idea why AMD is so cautious with the overclocking headroom? I would say that they're not necessarily being cautious. It's that maybe silicon variants is a thing. So they've found out like to to get their yields what what the typical working range is and they've they've slotted the cards into there at reasonable voltages because of course if you have to increase the voltage to increase the yields then you lose your efficiency and all that sort of stuff so they're trying to make the best product they can also they're probably trying to be pretty cautious about the whole AMD stigma of hot and loud so they don't want to push the cards to their absolute limits if they don't have to they they're quite competitive with where they're at uh, but if yeah, if you get good silicon, there is typically much more overclocking head or a bit more overclocking headroom. Let's say with with RDNA two versus Ampere memory, not so much. You run into you know memory errors and stuff like that if you go above like two point two gigahertz or thereabouts. So yeah, it's probably just they've worked out the the, the typical working range and they've they've gone into that because to as I said, to push above that, they probably have to throw efficiency out the window and they don't really want to do that because then they get back into the hot and loud territory, which is what they're trying to avoid. Yeah, and even if a custom overclockers, like, let's say, because there are power limits for these cards, aren't they, and clock limits, like, you can't just push well, them up to whatever you want. Some of that's to do with product segmentation. The memory yeah. limits are because if you actually overclock the memory further, you will break performance, and they probably want to avoid people from making the performance mm. regress and then saying, oh, my card's broken, my card doesn't overclock properly, or there's something wrong with my card. Yeah. So they're trying to uh, you know, counteract that. and will be the same for core overclocking because you wouldn't want them people to have like unlimited voltage sliders and stuff and then just be like, oh, I'll chuck that all the way up and then blow up your car or reduce its lifespan and have your car die after three months. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't so... really comment on that too much because I don't know if that's the reason, but also I don't know how much of that they were seeing. Yep. So if they're trying to protect people's investments and save people from themselves, then I guess fair enough, although we prefer <laughs> people to have their f own freedom. But I don't have the, the information as to whether or not that's what they're doing and if that's a good thing or not. So, yep. yeah. At current state, buying a pre-built is the only option because there are pre-builts for 1600 to 1800 euro with 3070, whereas the 3070 alone is going for 1400 so, if buying a pre-built, what things are important to look out for in other components? Um, I guess it depends on the type of pre-built, like who does it, like if it's a, a sort of a boutique builder or like a Dell or HP, because I really try to avoid the bigger brands like Dell and HP because they typically go for proprietary power connectors and power supplies and then cases with different mounting that you know you can't put an atx power supply in there i don't know if that's entirely true for all of their systems it's probably not um but i've run into you know past experiences with friends who have bought like an alienware system and upgrading it's very very difficult slash near on impossible so boutique builders typically use like motherboards from msi gigabyte asus asrock and so on and so forth um, so they're the kind of things I'd look out for. Basically, look out for a system with like a motherboard that you can buy off the shelf because if it's got that, it's probably got a standard power supply and all the other components. So it'll be easy to upgrade in the future because it sounds like you're the kind of person that's going for a pre-built because you're forced to, uh, but you would like to build it yourself and therefore you'd like to have the freedom that you'd normally have when building it yourself. So yeah, we've got a number yeah. of like PC parts companies in Australia that you know, will also offer pre-built systems and they're very good. So if you can find something like that where you live, that'd be the way to go. Yeah, it's definitely the way to go, especially if you're, as you say, normally a DIY customer because the one thing you don't want to sacrifice as a DIY customer is upgradability. So yep. I'd be looking for, yeah, maximum upgradability by using standard parts, which is why, yeah, your HPs and your Dells are probably not going to give you no. what you'd want if you normally would just buy a graphics card or thinking of building a system from scratch. So, so you just find yeah. out what motherboard's in it, and that'll probably tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, and then from there, if you know the components, you can often do your research on those components. So, for mm -hmm. example, if one pre-built system was using a really dodgy motherboard mm -hmm. and another pre-built of a similar price was using a good quality motherboard, then if they're telling you what parts are being used, then that is going to give you... Mm. you know a lot of the information you need because those components are going to have individual reviews whereas again like an like an oem system from dell is going to be using like a dell cooler and a dell power supply and mm. dell motherboard you're not going to get the information there yeah that's right all right and i think now we're in may 
we took pretty that much long, yeah <laughs> so, no, that was a lot of really good questions genuinely a lot of really good questions for this series i reckon mm. a lot of fun answering them a lot of different things i think we've done for the last few months it's all been about you know what's the deal with pricing what's the deal with supply and all that sort of stuff and the reality like, sunk in now and everyone's really depressed <laughs> they're, like, they're sitting at home they're like oh the gpu situation but at least we can ask some different questions maybe that's what it, se- interest, that's yeah. what it seems like yeah people are over the situation they've they've come to terms with it and we've got a different yeah mostly different questions now so anyway i think because of that it was a lot of fun answering them there's just different things to talk about so thank yep. you for that um and that is really going to do it for this month's q a series so hopefully you guys enjoyed part one two and three uh, make sure you've watched them all if you've only for some reason skipped to three we had a one and a two which were really good as well and yeah so thanks again we uh if you want to get more involved with the channel support us directly we have float plane patreon you've probably heard of those things before links for them will be in the video description they are very cool you get stuff like uh exclusive discord chat so that's for members only Tim and myself are very active in there. Tim's always, I always see you commenting in hashtag monitors and stuff like that. Uh, live streams, we just did that, but we'll do another one next month. Behind the scenes content, Q&As. Aware of Q&As? Uh, so anyway, very cool stuff. So if you're interested, subscribe. If not, perfectly fine. And we uh, appreciate you just watching this video. That's also very awesome. So I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. See, see you again you. next time. Later. <laughs>